Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Don't do that. Make me even more nervous. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Let's try that one more time. You guys are better than that, I hope. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's like, man, if you guys are as quiet as the last service, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, so, Rob is gone today, and um, a few weeks ago, he, he's taken his leadership team out, and I think they're in Cedar Falls, if I'm right, and uh, a few weeks ago, he got a hold of me and asked if I'd be willing to uh, speak, and uh, I said, sure, absolutely, why not? So, he wanted me to let you guys know that um, the service, the, the series that you guys are in, over, uh, I think it's emotional maturity, that uh, you guys will be right back into that next week. And this week, you guys just get to listen to a crazy little Pentecostal preacher. So, um, this is a little awkward for me. I'm going to be completely honest with you. It's a little better than it was last service. Um, preach there at once, and I'm, I'm good. I think the awkwardness of it is, is I was the youth pastor here years and years and years ago. Um, Sam was one of the youth during that time, and then they fired me, so that makes it really awkward. Yeah, you guys can laugh at that. It's okay. Um, and so, you know, coming back and, and standing in this pulpit, it's kind of a strange little exercise. But uh, I am currently pastoring um, a church in Osage, Iowa called Life Church, and uh, like I said, uh, I... You guys are going to have to help me this morning. I come from a loud church. Like everybody in our congregate, they say amen. Uh, they used to not, but we got them doing it. People will clap. People will say preach it or, or whatnot. And, and so I need your help or this isn't going to be nearly as fun uh, with me just bashing you over the head with things. Right, there we go. There we go. See? You feel much better saying amen when I bash you with things. There we go. So let's pray, and we're going to get right into it this morning. Father, we thank you this morning that you are, you are holy, and you are awesome and magnificent. Holy Spirit, fill this room with your presence. Nothing, nothing else matters but you. I pray, Father, as we go through your word, as I speak your word, anything that I say that's not of you, Lord, let it go in one ear and out the other. But what's of you? Whatever it is that I say today that's spoken, say that's of you, fill it in our hearts. Your word is like a two-edged sword. So, Father, cut away the filth, cut away the sin, cut away the decay with your word today. Strip our heart of all our idols. And fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, like I said, I was the youth pastor here. So, um, I was Wesleyan for a year and a half. And um, in that year and a half, one of the things that I learned about the Wesleyan tradition is its love and affection for the term holiness. Uh, John Wesley himself uh, preached on holiness a great deal. And then... Uh, in Wesleyanism, Methodism, uh, the concept of holiness became a central focus, especially in the United States. Um, and so today, I, I want to preach on a message that I think, I hope, will be dear to your hearts, and that is a message on holiness, but not yours. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't care about your holiness right now. 
I want us to talk about the holiness of God. Because God is holy. So if you guys would go with me to Revelation chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. Now, I will warn you all, I, I'm a Bible guy, and when I say I'm a Bible guy, I mean I don't do like one or two verses. There's going to be a lot of scripture today. You're going to have to hang with me. Uh, there may be some of this, by the, we're midway, and you're going to be like, I have no idea where he's going. It's okay. We'll go somewhere. We'll get there together, and when it's all done, it'll be wrapped up in a pretty bow, and you'll be like, ah, oh, okay, I get it. So, Revelations chapter 4, starting in verse 1 through 8, reading out of the New International Version. This is John, um, the beloved, on the island of Patmos. He had been placed there, imprisoned for being an apostle of Jesus Christ. And um, on the Lord's Day, he had a vision. And we're going to read a little bit about what he saw. He said, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the thrones came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Okay, let me get your bearings here really quick before we proceed with the rest of this verse, these verses. So John is... is spiritually been taken up into the throne room of God that is in the heavens. And, and, and this place, hear me on this, this place is as real as anything any of us could experience. It just happens that it's spiritual. It, it's spiritual. So John's, John's taken up in the spirits. He sees the throne room of God. And what he sees is this throne. But did you... Did you ever hear him actually describe what God looked like? He doesn't. He says that he gives colors and then lightning and peals of thunder and then a rainbow that encircles the throne like that's emerald green. What's interesting about this is, is John is looking at the one on the throne and he can't describe him. He can't, John can't say he looks like this. Sometimes in our Western Americanized idea of what God is, we'll have like this old man with a long beard and he looks more like Gandalf, right? But the reality is what John saw was so overwhelming, so magnificent, so holy, if you will, that he could not, he had no categories to describe him. So all he could say was, he's like this color and this color and lightning's coming out and I hear sounds. That's it. That's it. That's how he describes him. Now, now this is John's first sighting of Yahweh on his throne. Now let's go on and finish the rest of these verses. It says, in the center around the throne were four living creatures. Okay, let's stop right there. So you have the throne of God around him, and, and he's, emerald, you know, he's got all these colors and lightning and, and thunder and pills and whatever pills are, pills of thunder, right, going around him. And I mean, it's just, it's hard to imagine. Then outside of that is 24 thrones of elders. And these, these 24 thrones represent the 12 disciples and the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of uh, you know, Jacob, and Ish, or, uh, Jacob and all the boys, basically, right? And Joseph and all the boys. So the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. But then it says, in the center, surrounding the actual throne, in the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in the front and in the back 
The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around the wings, even under its wings. Day and night. Everybody say that. Day and night. They never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That is some freaky creatures right there. Eyeballs everywhere. If you would, I I think in our modern mind, the best way maybe to describe this would be um, these beasts, these creatures, these spiritual beings, they have GoPros all over their bodies. GoPros on their wings, under their wings, on their backs, on their fronts, GoPros everywhere. And they have one job from the, from the moment they were created to this very day, to this very day, they have one job and they do it day and night, night and day. They circle the throne of God. And no matter what direction they're standing in, whether it's to the back, they have GoPros. Whether it's with wings open, GoPros. Wings closed, GoPros. The front, all GoPros. Eyeballs everywhere, and they're circling the throne of God. Their their one job, their only purpose in all of creation is to bear witness to the one John saw. To bear witness to the unspeakable. To the one who passes and surpasses every category our brain has. And they give us one word to describe God. Holy. Not just holy. Holy, holy, holy. If you brought these cherubims or seraphims into a courtroom and you said, hey, we, we want to know who this Yahweh is. Who is he? Testify and tell us who God is which is exactly their job. This is why eyes fill them. There is not a, think about this, there has not been a point in history from their creation to today where their eyes have not been on him. What a beautiful creature. I mean, how magnificent is that? That's my prayer. Like, Lord, I don't ever want to take my eyes off of you. And yet my heart and my flesh is so corrupt still. It just, you know, like I'll go days where I'm not even sometimes thinking. Like, you know, like I'll have a brief moment in a car. I'll say a prayer. I'll get busy with ministry to people rather than ministry to God. These creatures, their job, their their very existence is looking on him every day, all day. Forever and ever and ever. And if you drove them into a courtroom and you said, tell us what God is like, they would say, well, I know it's antidotal evidence, but we have been looking at him from the day of our creation. We have been looking at him for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we will continue to look at him for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And every which way we turn, we see him. Every move we make, all we see is him. And there's, this is what we can say about Yahweh. He is holy, holy, holy. Over 400 times from Genesis to the book of Revelation, God is called holy. Over 400 times. Times. Let me just read two of them. Exodus 15, verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Over 400 times. Now, hear hear this. This may shock you. 
God is described as love from Genesis to the book of Revelation twice. Twice. He's described as holy over 400 times. He is described as love twice. One book, one chapter, two verses. I'll read them to you really quick. It's John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And 1 John 4, 16, so eight verses later. And so we know and, re, and rely on the love, of God, the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. The reality is today in the modern church world, we talk like God is mentioned as love 400 times and holy as twice, when in reality he's mentioned as holy 400 times and love is twice. Now hear me, I'm not saying God is not love. The scripture says he is love. The word does not contradict. So, so what's going on here? The emphasis of, te- of the text, of the holy text, that we believe God breathed and inspired. So this is the revelation that God wants you to have about him. Not something that man makes up, but something he inspired so that we could know him. And he tells us over 400 times, he is holy. And twice he tells us he is love. You see, what what I think is going on here, and I'll show you a passage that I believe shows this, is that we're not denying, I'm not denying all the characteristics of God. What I'm trying to get us to understand is his main characteristic, his main nature, the the center of who God is, is the word holy. And everything else flows out of his holiness. In Galatians chapter 5, we have the fruit of the Spirit. Do you guys know the first name of the Spirit? You, don't, you know this. It's kind of a joke, so you got it. There you go. Right? The Spirit's first name is holy. Now, what's the, what's the fruit of this Holy Spirit or, or what's produced from the Holy Spirit in our lives? In Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. Everything that the Holy Spirit produces in us, God already is. Right? But He is first and foremost holy. In other words, we don't know love until we know holiness. We don't know what beauty is until we know his holiness. We don't know what joy is until we gaze on his holiness. All of these characteristics that we make majors all flow from his holiness. We can't experience true, lasting, perfect joy until we experience his holiness. So... What is holiness? Because that just seems like a religious word. It's, it sounds like a word that says nothing. And as Christians, we have a lot of those words. It will say amen, and most of us have no idea what we mean. I, I can't remember what show it was, but somebody said amen, and a little girl mouthed off, and she's like, a woman. Right? And we have no idea. By the way, it means let it be. It just was a word that was never translated into English for some reason. We have hallelujah, right? Somebody said it earlier, you have no idea what it means, but we'll say it. Sometimes holy is that same way. What what does it mean that God is holy? Let me say this right off the bat. John trying to describe God is what it's like trying to describe holiness. You have no category for him because there is nothing like him in all creation. So the way you and I, the way our brains work, the way we comprehend things, is we, we have categories of things that we know and we see. And so if it, we'll, we'll look at something and we'll try to fit it into a known category in our brain so that we can comprehend it and understand it. When we look upon God,
God, we have never seen anything like him because there is nothing like him. That's what holiness is. It's a Hebrew word that means a cut above. It was a term that was used within the butchering community of the Hebrew people. So if you had a, a beef or a lamb and there was a portion that was better and more perfect than all the others, it was holy. It was a cut above. It was perfect. Everything else could be good, but this, this is separate and perfect. When we talk about holiness within the saints of God, we're not talking about our perfection. We're talking about our position in Him. I am holy, meaning that I have been set aside and, and my life is dedicated to giving the Holy One praise and glory. I'm not perfect, but He defines me as holy because He has separated me unto Himself. Holiness is an act that comes to us in grace. But when we talk about ho the holiness of God, that God is holy. I think the only way that my mind can comprehend this is to say he's, he's fully, dangerously perfect. He's so beautiful that if we actually saw him with our physical eyes, I think we would just melt before him. There's a theological word that, try, that helps us talk about God as holy, and it's the, the word is ineffable, ineffable. What it means, ineffable means, is too great or extreme to be expressed or described in words. Something that is so awesome that our words fail us. That is Yahweh. That is Yahweh. When I was a kid, my dad took me to the Grand Canyon. Before he took me to the Grand Canyon, he took me to a place called Bryce Canyon. And Bryce Canyon is awesome. It's made out of sandstone. And so when the, when the waters went through the sandstone at Bryce Canyon, it formed what looks like castles. If you've never been to Bryce Canyon today, go Google it and look at the pictures. It's phenomenal. Now, I was a little kid, and I loved castles, Sir Lancelot, and all that type of stuff. And so, you know, in my mind, I'm like seeing dragons fly through the air. And it was just, it was, it was awesome. It was incredible. And it was really hard for me to imagine that nature made that. It looked like somebody, you know, created it. Like, they, it literally looks like a humongous sandcastle. Now, the cool thing about Bryce Canyon is when I went out to the observatory deck, you can see it all. Like you, can just, you can see it all, and it's gorgeous. Then the next day, my dad took me over to the Grand Canyon. Now, he had asked me, what did you think of Bryce Canyon? And, and I was like, it's the coolest place in the world. Like, I, I want to go every single day because it's a, it's a massive sandcastle. It's just awesome. So we get to the Grand Canyon, and, we, and we're walking up, and we get to the observatory deck, the first one that we go to, and we stand out, and I'm just looking. And with Bryce Canyon, I could see it all. When I got to the very edge and I looked out at the Grand Canyon, it was overwhelming. I could just see a small portion. Like it, it was so huge that my little eight, seven year old brain could not comprehend. Like it was almost, it was almost like I was disappointed because at Bryce Canyon I could see it all and, and that fit in my brain. Like I could categorize that. With the Grand Canyon, I had no category for what I was looking at. It was awesome. Well, in the same way, when we talk about God, that's what we're talking about. You have, you literally have no category to place Him. As a matter of fact, I'll go with this far. If you have a category to place God in, you are committing idolatry. Because there is nothing like Him. There is nothing like Him. He is holy, completely distinct and separate, perfect. Now, what does this mean to you and I? My, here's my goal. My goal is to convince you 
that you need to refocus on the holiness of God. That's my goal today. So let me give you two reasons why the holiness of God benefits you mentally, physically, and spiritually. I'm going to give you two reasons, and then we'll break it on down a little bit more. So over the last decade, neurologists have been studying um, the science of awe. What happens to a human being when we stand in the presence of something that makes us feel so tiny we're in awe? And it's only been studied over the last two decades. And this is what they've discovered, that it, it reduces stress by, and it triggers the release of oxytocin. Right. Sorry, my wife's a nurse practitioner, so I'm just going to look at her when I do medical works. It triggers the release of oxytocin, which is known as the human love drug. When you stand in awe of something, your brain releases a chemical that makes you feel loved. Now imagine this. Many of you have experienced this. You're in the midst of worship, and you, you've, you've gotten past the music part of worship to where you're no longer even focusing on what the band sounds like. You can hear them, but it's no longer the point. And your, your heart is completely bent to God. Your, all your mind, your imagination, everything is bent towards God. And you know you're in his presence. Every one of you that have experienced that, you know the other thing that you've experienced? I feel loved right at this moment in your presence. I feel accepted and loved. Now here's what's so cool about it. God literally created every human being to feel accepted and loved when they stand before his holiness in awe and wonder. You were created to look at him like those four creatures around the throne were created to look at him. You were created to gaze upon him and be like, I have no words for you. You, you alone are awesome. And when that happens, our body releases this this love drug. The second thing that our body does is it lowers the level. I'm going to spell this. Any of you good spell people, you can shout this word out to me. Actually, don't. That would be distracting, so don't do that. But here's, the, here's what it is. It's C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. Cytokines, I'm guessing. What's that? Cytokines? Yeah, whoever said that, it's that word. It's that word. That's beautiful. Wow. Somebody knows Latin, I think. Anyway, it lowers the levels of what she said. And, and, and so here's the cool, here's the cool. What does that mean? Well, it means that it lowers the levels of inflammation in your body. So th- these, these beautiful things in your body, when, when a disease comes in or an infection comes in, they, they create what's inflammation. And that, that begins to fight off the infection and stuff. But, but the problem with inflammation is that if you live in a state of inflammation, it begins to decay your body. It's, I mean, let's just be... I mean, diabetes is partially due to inflammation. Cancer is inflammation. Like, like, inflammation, constant inflammation, is a negative, negative thing. It's bad. So when we stand in awe, the very elements of our body that produce inflammation to heal our body, are then reduced. So today, most of Americans live with high levels of inflammation because of our diets and just the very things that we take in our body. Your bones, when you wake up in the morning, you're sore, not because you worked out, but just because you're sore all the time, is likely because of inflammation. Most of your sicknesses and diseases are based off of inflammation. So So God not only created you to stand in all of his holiness so that you could feel loved and accepted and embraced, 
But he also created you so that when your body is inflamed and you stand before the holiness of God and you're in awe, he heals you. Your body automatically begins to heal itself when you look at him. That's incredible. It's like you were purposely created by him to look at his holiness and to stand in awe of it. Not only that, I mean, this, this, these are good things. But our world is so full of negative self-talk and depression when we stand before something that makes us like be in awe, the next, the third thing it does is it, it, it deactivates the part of our cortex involved with how we perceive ourselves, which eliminates your negative talk. In other words, when you stand in front of something that's so much larger and bigger than you, and you feel tiny and almost insignificant, you can't say anything negative about yourself. Because all you can do is be like, whoa, whoa. You're not, you, you're not self-centered when you're in front of awesomeness. You're not even thinking about you when you're standing in front of something awesome. So therefore, the negative self-talk just disappears. So when we stand before God in his holiness, this, this cut above, this so perfect it's in ineffable. We have no words to describe him. He's just, he's awesome. We feel loved. Our bodies are healed and the negative talk ceases. Wow. Like I said, it's, it's as though he created us to look upon his holiness. The second benefit of looking upon the holiness of God and being in awe, is being in awe of the holiness of God reorients us from self-worship to a life of divine worship. And I think this is probably the most important one for me. As I see a world that's, well, a world full of narcissists who suffer with self-shame and entitlement. You know, when all you can think about is you, then you're always going to see the negative of you. And so you're going to feel shame. And we are the most self-centered culture in the world. No, literally, that's a scientific fact. We are the most self-centered culture in the world. Nobody else in the world thinks more about themselves than Americans do. Crazy is that? Like, that's just, just deeply ingrained into our culture. We're the type of people that, as individuals, we think we should have a theme song everywhere we walk. And we, you know, it's like we're the center of our story, and everybody is a co-actor. I mean, God is even a co-actor in my story. He exists for me. Like he's the little genie I can rub the lamp and get him to come out and grant me my three wishes. He's Santa Claus. He, he, he exists to give me what I want, to make me feel good. Why? Because I'm, I'm self-centered narcissist. And I think the world revolves around me. And then when you have millions and millions of those of us that think like that, it's no wonder none of us can get along. Like, I don't want to be the co-host of your story. You're the co-host of my story. Like, that's how we think. We, and, and what that is known as, biblically, is worship. Most of us, the largest true idol in our lives is us. It's not even money. It's not even power. It's me. I'm the God that I place in front of God. It's you. You're the idol that you place in front of Him. Your desires, your wants, not His, yours. 
And so when we focus, when we see his holiness and we're in like, we're in all of him, it shifts us from being self-centered to being divine-centered, from being self-worshippers to being divine worshipers. Dr. Dacre Keltner at UC Berkeley, a neurologist, he wrote this in a medical journal article. He says, We are at this cultural moment of narcissism and self-shame and criticism and entitlement. All gets us out of that. A secular scientist who is a materialist is telling us that we are in a cultural moment of unbelievable self-destruction and the only way we can get out of it is to live a life where we are in awe of something else. Again, it's almost as though God created humanity to stand before his holiness and be like, You are awesome. You are awesome. The church of Jesus. Like, we can talk about the world, but let's just be, let's be honest, let's be real. Like, sin or sin. Unredeemed people are going to act like unredeemed people. I, I can't control the world. I can't. I can't be like, you all need to be holy. And that, that's just kind of, that's just dumb, right? It'd be like looking at a pear tree and saying, you need to be an apple tree. It's like not until the apple tree is, you know, the pear tree is cut down and apple trees planted, which is what happened to you. You were cut down. You were killed. You were executed in the cross of Christ when you gave your life to him. And a new you was born again. A new tree with new fruit rose. So I'm, my message today is not to any unbeliever. I'm talking to the church, to the household of God, the saints of God. We, you and I, need to refocus on the holiness of God. We have to refocus on the holiness of God. I mean, the American church thinks worship is a preference. Think about that. We'll, I, mean, I know you have cameras, but I'm just going to step down and talk to you for a second. We will, we will pick a church based on the kind of music they play. Because worship is a preference. We'll pick a church based on the decor. Because worship is a preference. Now, now hear me. Unbelievers think that way. That's why we make pretty churches. Well, that, and it's an act of worship to God. But many times, we will build churches and sanctuaries in the modern day to appeal to the senses of unbelievers. Because as believers, we're not supposed to think worship is a preference. But we do. We absolutely do. Don't answer this out loud, but answer it in your head. How many times have you ever left a church and you said, ah, I didn't really like worship today? Hear me on this. It was never about you. Worship isn't about you. It's not like we're worshiping you. The songs weren't written to please you. The songs aren't sung so you get goosebumps. So if you don't like hymns, but somebody but we sing hymns, that hymn does not stop you from worshiping him. If you love hymns, but we're singing really cool choruses from Bethel, it, that song from Bethel doesn't stop you from worshiping him. It's not your preference. Worship is not a preference. It is a command. It is something we do before the Holy One. You can't help but do it if you see him. And my concern, my my fear, is that the church in America has stopped seeing him. That all we've done is seen ourselves in the mirror and asked ourselves, what kind of church would I like? 
Who cares? Literally, the kind of church you like won't save this world. A holy and awesome God will. Or the, the first service this morning, like all the lights started doing crazy things. Like blinking off and on in different colors. And, and, and like everything was just being weird, right? I was convinced that Rob had an app on his phone. And he was sabotaging me. What was crazy is, is I had just made the point that we don't need any of this to worship him. You could strip all of this away. We could be out in the cold today, and he's still worthy to be worshiped. Because he's holy. He's holy and he's awesome. And all of this could go away. And he is still holy. This is preference, guys. This is not. How do I say this? Like at, my, at our space, we, we redid it all up. So we wanted to be a place that where if you walked in, you didn't feel like you were walking into a 1960s funeral home, which is what our space felt like. Uh, no, seriously, we had a, this huge hanging cross on the ceiling that had fluorescent lights in it, and then blood red carpet, and then wood paneling on the walls. It was scary. Like It was like, whoa, what, what horror flick did I just walk into? All right, so we changed it up, and we did. We, we made changes for the, to know that we wanted people who walked in not to feel like they walked into a time machine. Like we wanted them to feel comfortable so they could hear the gospel. But if you went to Africa today, if you went into a poor, poor state of Nigeria, and you went and worshipped with Christians in Nigeria, who, by the way, right now are being persecuted by Muslims, which would mean that you'd probably have to hide while you do worship together. None of this would matter. The light shows, even the cool band, the Bethel music, the hymns, whatnot, none of it would matter. The only thing that can sustain a church like that is the holiness of God. They are a people who have seen his glory. They have beheld him and they love him even when their lives are being threatened with death. We in the American church aren't there. We have a long ways to go and I'm, I'm convinced it's because we have not seen the holiness of God the holiness of God has left our imaginations. The American church has been telling God how we will worship him and how he better accept it. He said, no, no, pastor, we don't do that. Yeah, we do, because every part of our lives, Jesus said this. He said, love the Lord your God with all what? Your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. That means every part of you as a human being, right? Okay. So that means that every aspect of what it means to be a human is to be an act of worship. So how will we worship in our marriages? Do we allow the word of God to tell us that? Or do we tell God, no, 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 I'll worship in my marriage the way I want to worship in my marriage. How about our sex lives? Do we worship God with our sex lives? Like, this, this is a huge issue right now in the American church. We have, we have denominations that have been established for hundreds and hundreds of years that were, were established by faithful believers in God that are breaking apart because they can't figure out that God dictates our sex life, not you and I. Because our sex life is worship, not a preference. How about our finances? If I looked in your checkbook, I'd probably find out who you're worshiping. If you looked at my Amazon account, right? Are our finances worshiping God? I, I, Rob didn't pay me to say this, but I'm, I'll say it anyway, just for him. Are you tithing? Are you worshiping God in this house with your finances? 
If you're not, that's a problem. I mean, that, that's a problem. We've got to grow out of that. Do you worship him with your money? Or do you worship you with that money? Who gets that money? I mean, he's only asking for 10%. And we're like, no, nah, I can't. I remember when my wife and I were young, Bible college, had a couple babies, stupid young, and just stupid too. And we wouldn't tithe. We were like, we don't have the money for this. We couldn't even imagine, like, how, how can I give when we don't have the money at the next paycheck anyway? And one day, my wife just did it. Like, without my permission, she just did it. It was a dumb way that she did it. She gave $500 to some TV ministry. It was crazy, right? But here, here and I remember I ran to my pastor and I told on her, you know? And he was like, I mean, yeah, she probably should have gave it to her church. It's kind of weird that she'd give it to that TV guy. But he challenged me. He said, Stephen, just watch the month. Watch what happens. You know what happened? Two things, two beautiful things happened. One, I stopped spending money on me because we just gave $500 away. Two, all of our needs were taken care of. In other words, by being obedient to God, it curved my sin nature. And by being obedient to God, he blessed us. So are you worshiping him with your checkbook? It's a simple question. It's not a preference. How about our social relations with one another? How about this? As the American church, we've turned a donkey into, and an elephant into literal Old Testament idols. We have made politics the new religion of America. We have put our faith in a man or a woman to save us. And, and, and this year is the most important election of your lifetime. They say that every four years. It's the same message every four years. And if you don't vote the way I vote, you're a traitor to the nation. It's... We, we have literally turned politics into a cult. And our God is an elephant or a donkey. It's disgusting. But that's filling the American church. I know it's filling the American church because 2016, the churches began to split at rapid rates that had never been seen in the United States. And then 2020 came and it was even more rapid. And the only two things that can explain it is politics and COVID, which, by the way, was just politics again. Literally, like, whether you, whatever you believed about COVID, almost everybody made the decision on COVID based on politics. That's just nuts to me. That's the type of church that the American church has become. We've lost the holiness of God, and we've replaced it with self-focus and self-worship. And the result has been personal and social decay and death. Our nation is not falling away and, and, and dissolving into nothing because the sinners are bad. It's because the church has lost the holiness of God. I'm not blaming the sinners for where our country has gone. You can't either. You got, we got to look in the mirror and realize we've lost something as the church. We've lost something very beautiful and powerful. We've lost the very thing that gives us life, the very thing that makes us different, the very thing that causes people to look at us and say, I want what they have. We've just become materialists that sing goofy songs. Like the world are materialists that sing better songs. That's basically been the only difference in the last 15 to 20 years. Obviously not with every church. I'm talking about the American church as a whole. I'm going to finish up here. I'm going to talk to you about two stories that try to help us make sense of this. The first one, I'm not going to read any of the scriptures. I'm just going to tell you about it. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, 16 through 21. It's about a king, king of Israel named Uzziah. 
And Uzziah became a very proud king. And, and I mean, he was, he was so proud that he began to act corruptly within the nation, and he was unfaithful to the Lord. That's how the scripture, describe, the scripture describes him. He's unfaithful to his Lord. So what he did to be unfaithful to the Lord, the scripture says, is he, a king, not a priest, entered into the temple where the king was not allowed to go. In other words, Uzziah thought he was so awesome, he decided he would tell God how he was going to worship. So he goes into the temple, and the temple priests are there, and they're like, whoa, whoa, King Uzziah, you can't come in. And he pushes him to a side, and he goes into the holy place. And there in the holy place, he gets the incense and the incense burner. And again, the priests, according to the story, are trying to drag him out. And he pushes his way into the holy of holies, which, by the way, God prescribed that a priest once in his lifetime would ever go in there, and never a king. And Uzziah pushes his way into the Holy of Holies, saying, and, and you'd be like, but, but he's just wanting to worship the Lord. No, 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 no. You see, when, when you decide that you can worship the way you want to worship, it ceases to be worship. Now it's just you loving yourself and thinking you're entitled to get whatever you want. And so Uzziah begins to do the incense, as the priest would do, in the Holy of Holies. And the scripture calls it strange fire. A fire of incense that God had never asked for or required. And so well, you know what God did? He struck Uzziah down with leprosy. And from that day until the day Uzziah died, King Uzziah died, he was never in the company of another human being. He was separated from the people because he had leprosy. His kingdom was taken away from him, and he was separated from his people. When you and I live in self-centered idolatry, what always will happen is separation. We'll be pulled apart. We'll be separated from the people of God. We'll be separated from God. And then it's just a spiral, spiral of self-destruction. The second story is, the book of, is, is in the book of Isaiah, and it's about the prophet Isaiah. And I want to read this because it's kind of interesting. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died. So the story of Isaiah starts the very year that Uzziah, the king who we just talked about with leprosy, dies. So the, king, the year the king dies of leprosy, and why did he get leprosy? Because God struck him with leprosy for going into the temple and worshiping the way he desired to worship, making worship a preference, not seeing God as holy, but as something that was common. So in the year that King Uzziah died, I, that is Isaiah, saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were, were seraphim, each with six wings, is this sounding familiar? It sounds like the first scripture revelation. With two wings they covered their face, and the two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the sound of their voices, of their voices the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah cries out, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. See, King Uzziah was a proud man. He had entitlement, and he treated God as something that was common. Whereas Isaiah was humble, 
and he treated God as holy. Uzziah thought he could force his way into the earthly holy of holies. Isaiah cried out in fear and terror when he was spiritually taken into the real holy of holies. Uzziah was killed by God for treating him and his space as common. Isaiah, the humble one who cried out, woe is me, was sanctified by God, purified by God, and put into God's service as a prophet. One who treated God as common was struck down dead. One who treated God as holy was elevated and purified. And bring the worship team on up, if you guys would. We as the Church of America need to have our imaginations recaptured by the holiness of God. His awesomeness, His power, His ineffableness, our, Him surpassing all of our mental categories. We have to stand again in all of Him. I think we as the church have to repent. We have to repent that we've treated him as though he was just common. Like he's no big deal. Let, let me ask you a question really quick. And you, don't answer it out loud, but do definitely answer it in your head. When you walked in those back doors today, when you came to the sanctuary to worship and to praise him, were you thinking to yourselves, I cannot wait to be in his presence and to stand before his holiness. I can't wait to tremble when his spirit floods into this place. Is that what was on your mind? Or maybe your mind was, pastor's not here and he said, if we don't come, we're going to be in trouble. Or, do you understand? or, or maybe it was like, oh, I'm... <clears throat> I've got to do children's ministry, which, by the way, that's my son doing children's ministry. It's weird being up here preaching and my boy's back there hanging out with the kids. But maybe I've got to do a ministry today. And so you, you come to church, not because you want to, not because you're expecting to experience the holiness of God, but because you've got some service to do. Or maybe, maybe you came to church because you're like, I need a healing in my body. So you didn't come to church to worship the King of Kings. You came to get something from him. Or maybe you simply came to church because you live in Charles City, and Charles City's in Iowa, and Iowa's in America, and therefore it's what you're supposed to do. None of which is worship. None of which is worship. We have to change our complete frame of mind. And when we do, when he again, his holiness recaptures our imagination, you will see a revival in this nation that you can't even imagine. When we, his people, are recaptured by his beauty, by his goodness, by his holiness, this world will too. They will too. So I'm going to invite you guys to stand.